All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, next up is Thijs, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Thijs van der Laag, and together with Marco Cox, um, we developed a Julia toolbox uh, for probabilistic programming named Fornilab. And I want to talk you through my story by means of a little example. Um, suppose that we want to develop some kind of a navigation app. And we might receive some data that looks like these, which are noisy measurements of a moving car. So on the, on, the, on the horizontal axis, we have the time. And on the vertical axis, we have the observed position. And now what we're interested in is to infer the actual position of this car. So now, how might we go about solving a problem like this? Now, the probabilistic programming approach um, starts with building a model. And this model represents basically our belief for how the data are generated. And from this model and the data that we have obtained, we can then infer the quantities that we are interested in. So in our case, it will be the position of our vehicle. Then we might be done and we might apply that, or we might go a step further and we might be interested in how well we are doing. So we want to criticize our model and come up with a measure for the performance. And based on that, we may repeat the process all over again. We revise the model a little bit and then we go through this loop again and again and again. Now, the left-hand side of this loop is, by definition, human work. To come up with a new model is a creative process. But everything on the right-hand side can be automated. And there are several other toolboxes that also try to do this. For example, uh, Stan, Edward, Infer.net, and as we've seen the talk before, Turing.jl. Um, but Fornilab differs, well, aside from the native Julia implementation, from these toolboxes in a slightly different way. For example, we use vector graphs, and then specifically forming style vector graphs, as a representation for our generative model. And I will show an example of that uh, in a minute. What's convenient about these vector graphs is that we can perform message passing on these to infer the quantities that we're interested in. And um, finally, we will use the free energy as a, me a measure for model performance, which basically indicates, it's a number that indicates how well our data fit the model that we have postulated. Now, if you put all these ingredients together and you let it simmer for a few years, then you end up with Fornilab, and it's available on GitHub. Now, back to our example. So, we might propose a model like this, where X represents the actual position of the car, and initially, at time zero, we are fairly uncertain about where we are. So, we represent that by x0 at time 0 to be a Gaussian distribution with a very low precision, which means a very high uncertainty. Now the next line states that the current position of the car can deviate a little bit from the previous position. So in other words, the car is allowed to move a little bit. And the third line says that the observations that we do are actually noisy observations of the actual position. Now, in Fornilab, we might write this model down as the code here shown below. So we have this macro, this, this at rv macro, that defines for us a random variable, and under the hood, it also builds up the vector graph line by line. And we have this placeholder function over there that indicates which quantities that we actually observe. So we observe all the variables y over all the times. Now, under the hood, this builds a phony style vector graph, um, which looks something like this. So, horizontally, you can see um, the hidden positions, and vertically, you can see that we have these observations. Uh, I won't go into detail on this. There are two excellent references below that will tell you all about how this is uh, mathematically uh, defined. Um, but the main takeaway message from this slide is that this is a very modular concept. So, once we'll go through this adapt phase, then we can just add nodes and, and shift a few edges, and then we can come up with a new model. And this turns out to be very convenient, and I'll show you in a minute why. Now, on to the next stage. We want to define an inference algorithm. And with Fornilab, we can do that actually in just two lines of code. And what these two lines of code do is they automatically generate a variational, variational message passing algorithm for us. Again, the details. Uh, of how this is done are uh, captured in this reference. This is a publication by Dowels. 
Um, but what this does is it schedules a message passing algorithm on this graph light construct that we have defined before. So these messages, they flow forward and backward across this graph and they pass information forward and backward. And by combining these messages, we can get a belief for the, for the quantities that we're in, interested in. Now, it doesn't stop there. Um, the most importantly, the most importantly what, you, what it returns, this, um, this variational algorithm function, is a function itself. Um, so basically, you could say that Fornilab is a Julia program that generates Julia programs for you. Um, and how does this work? Well, this step function, this inference function, accepts a dictionary of data and it builds an array of messages. So you can see that these messages, uh, this first message depends, depends on the data and also messages depend on each other. For example, this last message, the 499th, depends on the previous one. And what this returns is a dictionary of marginals which, um, which holds the quantities that we're interested in. And if we plot that, for example, this hidden state that gets returned, um, we get this red line, which, well, seems to be a fair estimate of, the actual, of an actual position that might, might uh, lay under, this, under these data. But we're interested also in, well, how good a fit is this? So we go to the next step, and in one line of code, we can actually um, define an algorithm again, that computes for us the free energy. So we have this, uh, this function, free energy, that accepts the data and the dictionary of marginals, the quantities that we have, uh, we have inferred, and it returns a float, it returns a number. And this number indicates um, how well uh, the data fit our model. So we can run this, this automatically generated program, and then we get a number, 294, all right? On itself, this number doesn't really say anything, but it gains meaning when we compare it to an alternative, right? So we go back to our model design cycle, and we, we, we repeat this process all over again. And as you might have noticed in this data, there was this kind of periodicity, right? So let's try to incorporate that into our model. So we adjust our code a little bit. We introduce this rotation matrix, A, and um, as a nice detail, um, you can see this multiplication operation. That's actually something that we have overloaded. So um, this multiplication is actually a matrix times a random variable. And what this does under the hood is it just um, adjusts the factor graph and it introduces extra nodes. So we can rebuild our algorithm and we end up with the blue line. We can rebuild our free energy algorithm and we end up with a new number, 205, which is significantly lower than the one that we had before. So then this new model becomes a reference and we can try it all over and over again until we're satisfied. So to summarize, we've developed Fornilab. Um, it's a Julia package that enhances the probabilistic model design cycle. Um, in essence, it's a Julia program that writes Julia programs, which is very convenient because then you can just hack away in the code itself and adjust it to your own liking. Um, and most importantly, it's available on GitHub. So thank you very much. All right, so are there any questions from the audience? For model comparison, how does the um, free energy compare to Bayesian information criterion or deviance information criterion or other measures? Um, well, the, the free energy is actually a bound on the model evidence. So um, if you have the if you have a Bayes rule, then um, you have um, the P of D, the probability of the data. That's actually what you're interested in because that's that's a real measure of how well the data fit your model. But Usually, that's very hard to compute. So there are alternatives, for example, the Bayesian information criteria or the AIC, AIC um, et cetera, et cetera, which are um, easier to compute. Um, but um, the free energy has um, a very 
a very interesting mathematical, mathematical meaning in that it forms an exact upper bound on the Bayesian model evidence, which is the thing that you're actually after, but it's very hard to compute. So, so that's why we use the free energy. It's, it's, it's principled and computable. All right, um, any other questions? Uh, here in front is. Oh, down there, excellent. You, you showed a, um, a singly connected graph there. Are there any constraints on, on structure? Can it be multiply connected in terms of your factor graph? A foreign style factor graph, uh, uh, edges always connect uh, two nodes. And um, so that's a problem because if you have normally a bipartite graph, you can just connect, uh, connect any node with any node. Um, but you can, um, for example, you can share variables through this equality node which basically, um, basically enables you to um, distribute this, to connect this variable xt uh, with factors that are connected to all kinds of different and uh, multiple variables. So we, we can talk later about uh, this if you want to know more about it. It's a kind of a long story to, to explain it in detail. So. Yeah. All right, um, any other questions for the speaker? Okay, uh, then let's give him another round of applause. Thank you very much.